Hello everybody, my name is Ramon and this is Ramon's Guide to Talk for Wednesday 20th of July 2022. At this point, it feels like it's been two years since I've recorded, started doing my podcast. It's two year anniversary. That's pretty crazy in a way. I mean, I wish I had a grave away basically, but uh, this past week has been pretty crazy in a way. And uh, obviously this week's episode, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, everything from uh, everything... We got a new. We got the foldables from Samsung coming, and the the, the leaks are coming thick and fast. Uh, to Netflix, could be adding a could be adding uh, is cracking down on password sharing to sim- to say it simply in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, uh, to all my European and British viewers or listeners, kind of, they probably have been in the middle of a heat wave this past week and. Uh, it's not really a big deal because um, where I come from in Bahrain, we already get hot summer days up to 40 degrees Celsius, but it's very unusual for that part of the world. So uh, if you're still stuck in the heat and if you're listening to this, stay strong and drink plenty of cold water. And um, I don't know, if you have air conditioner or fan, run that at full speed. And I don't know, just um, again, put a block of ice kind of. I mean, I don't know what to say really, but it'll, it'll just go by fairly quickly. Anyways, uh, so yeah. Um, without the way, let's get rolling, shall we? Alrighty, so the first thing we're going to talk about is Samsung and their foldables, pretty much the Z Fold 4 and Flip 4. And that's obviously coming pretty soon, uh, but probably sooner than than expected. Interestingly, we've gotten uh, we've gotten a post from Samsung, and they've kind of confirmed today uh, or yesterday, pretty much, that they're going to be doing an unpacked event on August the 10th, but it's pretty cool to see, and uh, obviously are teasing the foldables and all the colors you can get, apparently. Near the encoded message, the first one, it kind of shows the colors that these foldables will be coming in, so it's probably what we've been hearing, in a way, Uh, so that's pretty interesting. Um, But as I said, as these phones are going to be coming out um, in the next couple of weeks, the leaks are going to be coming in thick and fast, so definitely stay tuned um, next couple of weeks. We'll, ha- we'll probably have a lot to talk about on these foldables in a way, so that's pretty interesting nonetheless. Uh, now, what did you expect in the Unpacked event? As I said earlier, the Z Fold 4, the Z Flip 4, the new Galaxy watches, and probably other ga- other accessories that Samsung has, to, that Samsung is probably bringing to the table in a way. Um, now, what can we expect in the foldables? Probably a better folding display uh, with less creases probably and obviously higher storage options the latest processors the latest exynos or qualcomm processors in a way so that's pretty interesting in a way and um, if we're already talking about leaks coming in thick and fast 91 mobiles along with even blasts uh, sort of showed off um, sort of leaked the the z flip 4 and fold 4 uh, out there in person. I mean, a bunch of sources basically have uh, have leaked it already. And, um, well, to be honest, there's not much of a difference compared to the previous foldables. Uh, some slight touches, obviously some nice color, much nicer colorways, obviously comparable to the S22 Ultra in a way. And on top of that, um, it's slightly, i say the bezels, it's, again, if you peek hard enough, the bezels kind of are smaller, slightly smaller, and uh, this is a press images, so the crease is not visible. Obviously, when we get these foldables in our hands, obviously test them and play around with them, then the hint it'll be visible. You could see how visible the um, sort of the let's say how visible the crease would be on these folding displays. But I probably resume with the Z Flip Four. It looks a little bit like a it looks a little bit like an S twenty two flip phone to me, which is a strange. Uh, uh, probably a strange kind of um, what do you say um, a pretty strange you know conclusion I've come to so that's pretty interesting in a way and as I mentioned last week the colors that these foldables will be coming in as I said not as a, not much uh, as I said there's not it's not that indistinguishable from uh, the previous foldables so that's pretty interesting in a way but again, can't wait 
for these foldables to come out next month. Hopefully, the prices are obviously competitive, or as I said, um, you know, in line with the competition because we're getting a lot of com competitors to these phones, and um, you know, in in a way, so uh, that's pretty interesting, uh, to say the least. Alrighty, so we already touched on the Samsung foldables, and obviously, we're going fairly quickly from here on out, uh, but. Um, Already, we're talking. We're talking about Android phones that are coming out. Let's talk about phones that have already come out, and the Oppo uh, phones. Now, we don't touch upon Oppo phones that often, or Vivo phones, to say the least, because they're everywhere. Uh, they're not really high-end phones or ones with special features or capabilities. And again, uh, probably their phones have been recent past couple of months. Obviously, we have not been. I've have haven't dropped an episode. Uh, in sp in late spring, so uh, probably out of touch. But anyways, uh, but Oppo have uh, shown off the newest o Reno 8 phones, the Reno 8 Pro, and the 8 in a way. And uh, the Reno 8 Pro here, uh, uh, okay, yeah, the the 8 and the 8 Pro from Oppo. Uh, this was obviously announced a few days back. Um, and a um, couple of things to note is that the 8 Pro. Th is apparently such a cheaper Find X5 Pro, which is interesting as a judgment. Uh, to start with, you have a Dimensity 8100 Max processor. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sounding a bit quiet. It's just because I don't want to disturb the neighbors. They're sleeping. But this has a Dimensity 8100 Max, which probably is a souped up version of the 8100. Again, as I would say, I've not tested this processor, so I can't tell you the performance or its capability, but it's again on the higher end of the mid-range spec. Uh, you have a 6.7 inch, 120 hertz FHD plus OLED display, a 4500 milliamp hour battery, along with the 80 watt, uh, with 80 watt fast charging wired out of the gate, along with, and get this, a Mary Silicon X imaging chip, the same as I said in the Find X5 Pro I talked about months ago, and would obviously improve processing of photos and videos and improve HDR and contrast and again adding more computational uh, more computational uh, processing so you could say to Oppo's cameras which is nice to have and as I said um, forget about the whatever the ISPs that come on the processors if uh, phones these these brands themselves can bring their own imaging chips it would hopefully offer a better experience so that's good to see in in the Reno 8 Pro now, uh, speaking of cameras, you have a 50 megapixel main IMX 766, along with 8 megapixel ultra wide, 2 megapixel macro, and then your 32 megapixel. Um, and the thing about the Renault phones, all right, the Renault phones have a focus on selfies. Epic selfie monster, yeah. Epic selfies for days. Speaking of selfies, uh, the front facing camera, you got a 32 megapixel. RGBW, which probably is like a nice fancy, basically a full regular camera, IMX709 sensor, giving you phenomenal selfies, and you'll probably look sensational if you know if you know that reference. If you get it, you get it. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Now, interesting, Oppo has shown off the Reno 8 and 8 Pro in India. So, as for price, uh, it'll be available for for around f starting from 45,999 Indian rupees. That's about six hundred dollars us uh which is probably as i said is, is on the higher end for an oppo phone at this point you might as well start getting the find x5 series phones because you get even better value and snapdragon chips but uh that's pretty interesting in a way but as i said uh, the reno 8 pro is probably like a solid uh, mid-range phone probably competing with the a73 from samsung and the nothing phone one which i talked about last week but the, no the nothing and Samsung phones, at least, would come with Qualcomm with solid processors, with better processing and optimization. And Oppo here, again, okay, I can't tell you how good the Oppos are because I haven't played with one of these Oppo phones in ages, but the Pro probably is targeting that mid-range segment, the same kind of people who want to buy an A73 in a way. So that's pretty interesting. Interesting enough, you have an in-display fingerprint sensor, which is a bit of a big deal on mid-range phones, along with Wi-Fi 6 and dual speakers. And um, yeah, so $600 for this. Uh, I kind of can see who they're targeting, the Pixel crowd, the, the Samsung A-series crowd here. And then if you don't want the Pro, and it's okay, it happens, I mean, you know the pro may be too much for the for the regular consumer. You have the standard spec 
Renault, Oppo Renault 8. This comes with a Dimensity 1300 chip, 6.43 inch, 90 hertz OLED display, um, a 4500 million power battery, 80 watt wired fast charging, along with a 50 megapixel main, 8 megapixel ultra wide, and 2 megapixel macro. It doesn't come with that processing, but as I said, is pretty good at around 29,999 Indian rupees, which is about $375 US, which is not bad. I mean, again, it's already in the mid range, it's pretty solid if you ask me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're the kind of person to buy mid range phones, then this is something you definitely want to look at. But as I said, if you don't trust media tech processors and you can't trust the quality of the cameras that you might want to look away from here but if you want a really good value these phones are worth checking out and if you don't care about the processor if you don't care about the media tech chip the cameras uh will you don't mind really you, you will enjoy these features the fast char if you want the fast charging the cameras the oled display definitely check out the reno 8 and 8 pro it's something definitely worth uh check some you could say something definitely worth checking out if Again, if you're into mid-range phones, especially phones that have Android um, in a way. So again, uh, something worth checking out. Wee, that was, that was fast. Anyways, while well, we're already talking about phones that have kind of come out and they're going to come out, let's talk about those that have not managed to make it past the prototype phase. Now, we've talked about the Surface Duo. This is a Android phone that Microsoft's made. And... Um, and interestingly enough, it's a pretty good phone being it's a dual screen phone. It's not a folding fo foldable. It's a dual screen phone. Apparently, uh, we already got in the Surface Duo 2, which is pretty good. It's decent. But there's supposed there was actually supposed to be a cheaper variant of the Surface Duo 2. And that never come to fruition. I, I would assume they would call it the micro... Uh, I'll probably assume they would call it the Surface Duo... Um, What's the name of their cheaper Surface that is like really, it's for like those kind of people who want a cheaper Surface. What would be the name? Uh, oh yeah, uh, Surface Duo Go. <laughs> Smart. So this comes from Android, uh, sorry, it comes from Windows Central. Sounds like Android Central, but okay. Uh, this comes from Windows Central and they reportedly, they report that a listing popped up on eBay for a cheaper Surface Duo 2. Now, let's just call this the duo 2 go because it looks like a surface go if it was a phone an android phone specifically a dual screen one and apparently this archive this has now obviously been deleted so it's been archived pretty much but this is a dev unit of the coat surface duo 2 but it's a light version a go variant let's just say that now the pictures from this listing are purportedly showing having the cameras having a smaller camera bump so that would probably mean it has one or two sensors to start with uh that's my assumption pretty much that it's not what they said here but again it's my assumption a slightly more rounded external design with a matte finish according to windows central big shout out to them for this reporting i'll link this article if you want to see it uh in the show notes if I'll, again hopefully and apparently flat displays and obviously i think the surface duos do have flat displays the original one had and then the second one was slightly curved it was like elevated there's like a layer of glass on top that's like curved on the edges that's pretty interesting in a way and this was this and this prototype was supposed to be a thing but apparently and they called code na code named it chronos but apparently uh this got scrapped because they had to focus on the on the neo t sorry on the uh, duo 2 the main flagship phone so this is like a prototype but you can get it it was on it was listed on ebay weirdly enough and uh, now it isn't so that's strange in a way uh but yeah it it, it is a fascinating thing it, it it looks obvious that microsoft was playing around was really tooling around with uh with making more android phones because obviously they've kind of seceded to android from windows phone early on and have made apps and launchers for Android, and obviously have made the Surface phone, you could say, the Surface Duo, and it looks cool. And I can clear, and obviously this target audience for these devices are, uh, you know, productive. Uh, sorry, you could say uh, productivity uh, folks who who want to. Power, you could say Android productivity power users in a way. Uh, and but it looks it's more interesting the fact that they were looking to create a Surface Duo that targeted people who. 
uh, couldn't spend the nearly thousand dollars for the uh, duo for the main duo too. So that's pretty interesting in a way, and they really tooled with it um, apparently. So yeah, so I mean it'd be great to have. It would, honestly, honestly to be to be frank with you, it would have been great to have a. Um, a surface duo that would be cheaper than the main one but then again i would probably assume it would have issues with selling and obviously some people would would probably uh, confuse it and be like oh this actually is the this is the duo okay so i think they weren't confident enough with their with their android phones what they were selling already so they probably were like okay let's just um let's just scrap it so aside basically the point aside from me mumbling on the basic point is that they um it looks like they did make basically tldr they made one of these uh mid-ranger one of these sort of more affordable uh duos but but they just then really i'm sure they then realized that it didn't make sense and they then scrapped it altogether and focused on the higher end phones so that's pretty interesting in a way it's again it, it, it's uh I'm sure it's a, it, Microsoft does go tend to go through a lot of prototypes as a company known for design and all these elements. So it's not surprising to say the least. Again, it's 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 interesting, and but at the flip on the flip side, it's not surprising to say the least. All right, let's just touch on more smartphone stories. I kind of probably added this in, but um, I forgot kind of. But let's just touch on it. Samsung is not going to be making the S22 FE because they're wanting to push more sales and obviously shipments of the S22 Ultra. I touched on this a couple of episodes ago about Samsung not planning to make an S22 FE because they have an excess stock of the A series and the S22 series and they want to push those sales forward and not an FE and that would obviously dilute the value of those other uh, lines of phones and so they ditched it and I've talked about it in the previous episodes so the reasons that exist but according to the ELEC uh, Samsung has stopped developing the S22 FE because they want to push sales for the S22 Ultra and hence by extension the S22 series apparently uh, they've allocated basically the chips that have would have been gone into the fan edition to the to the regular S22 Ultra uh, to increase its production and again boost sales by extension so that's pretty interesting again not surprising if you look at what's going on in globally the chip shortages and obviously inflation and all the last thing you'd want to do as a brand as big as Samsung is to create one more nine one more cheap phone so that people stop buying the main s22 lineup and the a series lineup and also the foldables potentially so honestly it's not surprising but they said but they've not they've, it's not the end of the fan edition it's not the end of the line uh, according to this article also, they claim that Samsung is going to be making, will make an S23 FE. But again, as I said, they're probably looking at the condition of the market and the circumstances. And they would, again, ideally would want, only want to bring out a fan edition if there are, again, if enough people run out and buy an S23 phones. And apparently they're looking to ship 3 million S23 FEs next year when that happens next year pretty much. And by, in that sense of the word, they'd, uh, Samsung's looking to ship somewhere in the ballpark about 20 to 30 million S23s in a way. So that would sort of make up for that. So that's pretty interesting. So in a nutshell, they've been having chip shortages and obviously, you know, have economic circumstances in a way. Um, so Samsung is looking to make, uh, is putting more effort in their s 22 lineup at the moment uh, but they will make an, a fan edition phone next year so that's pretty strange but again interesting none the less all right and if we're already talking about um wearables or moving to, moving on to very vari variables or smart watches in a way qualcomm has shown off a new processor the w5 the w5 and w5 plus variable platform and this is a brand new chip that will go on all sorts of smartwatches that run whereas by google and obviously other sort of leading variable variable operating systems that's pretty interesting in a way uh, but in a nutshell basically uh, this is a in one word it's a step up from the previous qualcomm chips for uh wearables to start with you have a four nanometer it's built on a four nanometer uh 
this is the W5 Plus Gen 1 uh, variable platform. So all kind of variable chips for different uh, kind of smartwatches in different circumstances. Everything from from uh, total fitness trackers all the way to sort of everyday Apple Watch killer smartwatches. So it's built on a four nanometer process. It features low power states for audio, Wi-Fi, and you know, and for location. And apparently, it's fifty percent better than the Wear Forty One Hundred Plus that replaces that this W5 Plus chip replaces. On top of that, you have a uh, you have four A53 cores and one M55 sort of uh, high sort of high efficiency uh, core, uh, 250 megahertz. So apparently, it's two times faster and can and can support all the way up to and has LPGDR4 uh, memory. And that's for a variable chip, so that's pretty interesting. And also you get an AI chip with the U55. Apparently it's two times faster, so that's pretty interesting. On top of that, um, the display sensors, notifications, and audio can sort of be offloaded, which is interesting. It's, it, these are weird stats, obviously. They don't make any sense. Uh, so if I just move this off from the screen. Anyways, um, on top of that, you have... Uh, it's so hard to, to look at what specs would make sense. So you have support for Bluetooth 5.3 up from 4.2 and 5.0. And you can you can also support a 1 watt speaker at 13 ohms. Again, giving you apparently two times richer experience from the previous, uh, it, from the previous ver uh, variable chip. And this can all be fit, packed in, SOC and more, power, power management IC. On a, on a board that literally is 90 millimeters with a height of 0 0.48 millimeters max. 30%, more than 30% smaller the, compared to the previous processor. And apparently there are 25 designs in the pipeline for the, using this new processor. So expect a flood of Android, sorry, a flood of Wear OS smartwatches potentially uh, featuring this W5 Plus chip. It's obviously one thing I'll say is good on Qualcomm, good good on Qualcomm for launching a new processor for a product segment that I would kind of overwhelmingly argue um, in a, a kind of would argue uh, is kind of ignored overwhelmingly and there's not much effort or development on that end, and when you, especially when you compare it to what Apple brings to the table. Um, <laughs> What Apple brings to the table, it's uh, this is this definitely is a big step up for uh, for the whole world uh, for Wear OS watches because they've been lagging and I'm and I'm being honest. If you talk to those who reviewed smartwatches, Mr. Mobile included, you probably will tell you how slow the Wear 4100 Plus chips have been, uh, and so this should definitely be a bit of a bit of a monumental leap. I mean, it's not significant, of course, but it should be a, a dramatic leap in a way so again good on qualcomm they've launched a new variable chip it's kind of welcomed i mean oh and you get 50 percent longer battery life i don't know if that makes a big difference but again uh, this is a uh, this should offer this should help uh, bring better and better smartwatches to the table which we really need when you look at what apple is bringing out of the out of the window and um and again you look at the competition from different players, including again companies that are making full-on wearable uh, wearables that can track all your health and stats and then do more. So it's pretty interesting, nonetheless. All right, we're switching gears from phones now to media. And uh, if you if you have a Nintendo console, a Wii U, or a 3DS, one thing I will warn you is the storefront is closing on the 27th of March, 2023. So March next year. Nintendo is going to be shutting down their eShop for those who have the 3DS and the Wii U. So if you haven't like bought your games or downloaded or redeemed anything, go and do it now. Open up your 3DS or Wii U and oh, log into the eShop and obviously get uh, those extra bits and bobs done. Download some games, buy some games or redeem uh, games that you probably have at that point. And obviously after that point, the store will be closed so you won't, won't be able to go and download titles and you'll have to then like rip from a computer and pirate and all so again if you haven't like as I say if you haven't redeemed or let's just say if you haven't redeemed or bought anything uh, just open up your 3ds or VU and check out the eShop you might find something useful and you'll be able to but very interesting enough if you already have bought DLC or games you'll be able you should be able to get 
software updates. Um, online multiplayer should still work after that after that closure of the eShop. You should be able to go and re-download games that you bought. So, as I said, if you haven't bought anything from there at that point, go do it now. You would probably would want to do it in a way. Um, and um, again, better safe than sorry. All right, let's talk about Netflix, the iconic video streaming service. So weirdly enough, uh, they obviously the service is growing. It's saturating. I mean, more uh, those who haven't, you could say those who haven't had Netflix in the past couple of years just already got Netflix, and uh, it's a thing. Everyone has it in the U.S. Almost everyone, uh, you know, let's just say that almost everyone has gotten. Uh, Netflix in a way. Oh, and uh, just now their Q2 earnings have come out and they've only lost 970,000 subscribers. Uh, again, beating some estimates and some analysts fears that uh, it would have been like 2 million maximum. And um, and this is obviously, so they, they, there's been changes with how Netflix has been doing things and they're planning to launch an ad supported tier next year pretty much according to netflix so that's pretty interesting but more than everything they made a point that they were losing subscribers or their growth were re was really tapering off because of password sharing this thing that people uh those buddies or families extended family relatives who could get their uh their, say their cousin or their brothers or their buddies netflix account and watch stuff off their account so that's pretty interesting in a way, and they're obviously not looking to crack down on it. And their way of cracking down on it, aside from detecting people who probably are not that actual user with their actual IP address and they're sort of an extra user logging into Netflix, they're adding a new feature called Add a Home, which is literally what it's called, Add a Home. Uh, because obviously everyone knows if you use Netflix, you will notice that you could it's it, all their accounts come with multiple screen uh, with multiple screens basically it's depending on the tier the, the ultra plan for netflix which is now around 20 bucks a month in some places and obviously still 15 buck, 12 to 15 bucks a month in some countries you can share f netflix up to four devices at once so they're all logged in with one id they can all watch on four different devices at once that's pretty interesting already but now they're adding in add a home feature which lets uh, the already existing users add extra members or accounts, apparently add sub-accounts to people that, uh, again, those who are, live in different homes, basically um, you can call it buddies or, again, far-flung relatives who probably used to share Netflix IDs, but now you can, you can get a sub-account for them for just three bucks a month uh if apparently if they use an account for more than two weeks outside their primary residence so i i don't know how that will work but how i'm understanding it is that if someone has logged into netflix and then they're outside that paying users as household for more than two weeks then um then uh, you'll have to sort of add uh, okay uh, uh, if it detects that your device is outside that IP, main IP address at home, uh, you could pay two ninety nine a month uh, to get add an extra home. So this is this is something that they're actually doing. Obviously, it's been reported over the past couple of months and years that they're looking to crack down on this uh, thing of um, of you could say account sharing. So basic subscribers can get to an extra home. And they can add that, add three three bucks extra for that feature. Standard get two, and obviously premium can add three extra homes for that pack, which is pretty interesting in a way. And they're trialing this out in Latin America, which is obviously where Netflix is more popular. In uh, if you live in Argentina, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, you'll be seeing this feature very soon, where you'll be able to add an additional home for three bucks extra. I can kind of see the appeal of it for some people who. Uh, for some folks who already have bank cards and they can try and their buddies are willing happily willing to pay uh, pay their buddies to get Netflix so share an account with them uh, share a paid subscription with them and uh, and those kind of buddies are probably nice can happily pass on the three bucks to them so it could be a good deal it probably at the same time could be an ingenious customer acquisition approach because you're already trying to get those kind of people who 
I haven't signed up for these streaming services, but obviously their buddies have, and they can you sort of free, still freeload, but down the road eventually have to essentially pay a little extra. Not them, obviously, but the those who who those have kind of uh, made an account and paying for it, and then they're sharing it with their friends and family or their um, in a way. Interesting enough, it'll make an exception if you're traveling as a primary user, potentially. I, now, as I said, I don't know how they'll detect that it's you're the main user and then your buddy is logging in from somewhere else. I think it would detect from the, your, as seen this picture here, it would detect from the where it's logged in. So you can tell. So that's pretty interesting. Obviously, it's not surprising, but as the timing is interesting in a way, and according to them, Today's widespread account sharing between households undermines our long-term ability to invest in and improve our service. I mean, if you're able to bring some interesting shows, then okay, good for you. But, I mean, if it's more of the same uh, woke stuff, then, um, well, people are going to password share because who are going to spend their hard-earned money? And then, then they're going to sit through um, lots of movies or series that are not useful or relevant. Anyways... Uh, rant, uh, mini rant I digress from my mini rant but this is interesting in a way and um, this is as I said this is probably similar now how I'm looking at it this arrangement or what Netflix is doing it's not more it's any, not any more similar to what music streaming services do like Apple Music and Spotify but those ones have requirements and obviously those like bundle plans so you pay one monthly price essentially allow multiple users to get that music streaming subscription like Spotify. They have plans for families and couples. And uh, the, uh, the condition is that you link in an email address or, an, or someone with another home address or that you all live in the same address and then you're able to get a shared plan. And Netflix by standard offers multiple screens. So people with one account can watch on different devices. That's great, obviously. But uh, I th honestly, I think they missed uh, an opportunity to offer sort of buddy friends or family plans where multiple users can can uh, pay for one subscription every month and essentially share Netflix with with different people what do you think what do you think of this password sharing or this again at a home feature that they're adding are you going to still pay for Netflix after all this are you going to cancel and become a pirate I don't condone it of course but are you going to go torrenting are you still going to pay for Netflix I think the three dollars a month is not so obscene uh, it depends on the on the person in question. It could be a lot for some people. It could be, uh, it could be too much, too little, too much because, you know, people have to wait a whole year or two for a new season of Stranger Things, and then you're making me pay more money for, for something I could do easily because well, I don't have five, seven, ten different screens or devices. I should be able to share with my friends. Do send me your feedback. Do you send me your thoughts. What do you think? Uh, do let me know. Um, you know. Shoot, shoot over your thoughts. I'd love to hear from you. So, it's pretty interesting, nonetheless. All right, we've already talked about Netflix. Let's switch over to Netflix's next best rival, Prime Video. Amazon, of course. Uh, Prime Video is very popular in some countries because you know why. Amazon Prime, it's a membership service, free shipping, discounts, Prime Day. You could get books from Kindle, of course, for free. And Prime Video, it's a, it's actually a big selling point for, uh, and that's why a lot of people have Prime Video. I don't nobody's gonna pay the five, six, seven, eight dollars a month for Prime Video. We we'll happily pay for Amazon Prime, so makes sense. Now, um, they're obviously a popular streaming service. Obviously, there's not not as well known or as uh, disruptive as Netflix. Of course, they've kind of been in its shadow. Let's just say that they've had some pretty good shows like The Boys and The Grand Tour which are pretty interesting and worth checking out in a way and another one i don't know the name of it but it's like a fantasy epic like their version of game of thrones anyways so they have a whole lot of other content interestingly uh, but one thing that people have complained usually and that is that the interface has been so weird or archaic uh, i read somewhere once that the video's ui looks a bit like essentially a budget airline, you know, a budget airlines cabin of video streaming interfaces. Netflix is far ahead, and so is Disney. I'm sure Netflix and Disney Plus is way ahead of the competition. It, it has a slick, it's got a slick and clean UI. It's nothing quite like it, but I'm sure those companies spend a lot of money on that. And Amazon's a unique situation in that Prime Video is kind of a thing, is kind of a magnet 
for Prime itself for that free shipping for online shopping. And so let's say that they have not put much thought, it's been an afterthought. Prime Video has been an afterthought in a way, but not anymore today. Uh, they've, re they've shown off a new interface for smart TVs and as so those with fire sticks. And it has a revamped interface. Now obviously sort of shows content sort of, um, now it probably shows an interface that's similar to all major streaming services in a way. So to start with, you have a top 10 chart that you, that obviously shows popular content on the service along with uh, with poster style artwork. So kind of like Netflix that has a whole, you know, if you've seen a tab on Netflix for all the originals and now they have the same thing for Prime. And also obviously now they visually indicate uh, whether that whether content on Prime Video is either available for purchase or rental or included with Amazon Prime. This is actually a big this is actually a big pain point with Prime Video. People forget to realize it. And that is that when you browse Prime, you suddenly look for like a completely new movie. Like let's just say you suddenly find a new Minions and then you uh, you click onto it and then you realize, oh shoot, you have to buy or rent it. Oh man, I thought it was with Prime. So it kind of leads to like a massive confusion that, oh, is it, uh, is it included with my Prime membership or do I have to rent it? And not anymore. They now offer visual indicators at the bottom of the content, whether a little blue tick, uh, whether it's with Prime or you have to buy or rent it or let's just say get a different, uh, get another subscription to watch it. It can be confusing because Prime, you could do a lot on it. Uh, you can do a lot on Prime Video. You could use, if you have, Amazon Prime itself or the subscription, obviously the main one, you have access to shows like The Boys. And then there's obviously a la carte subscriptions. So let's say you can get a Paramount Plus through Amazon and Amazon builds it. It's in your credit card, you know, it's built by Amazon. And then there is, uh, you can rent and buy movies and then you can watch free channels. It can get very confusing. So it's good to see that they've made a revamped, a slightly revamped, revamped UI. It's long awaited. So it'll be a relief to those who have uh, who use Prime Video every day uh, because it can, get, it can get very confusing nearly. So yeah, uh, one of the many sort of improvements is the visual indicator. So you get a yellow star if that say that content is from like an a la carte subscription or you have to buy or rent it. So again, it'll be, it's a small thing, but makes life a little easy. So again, it's a nice kind of visual cue as it's known in the industry. And also you'll be able to filter content by if it's in 4K or say it's a sci-fi. So that's pretty cool in a way. And also now the interface uh, should show sort of distinct, sort of sorted out the menu, the rows kind of now. Uh, you could say have a sandwich menu to the left and I'll give you home search and obviously the purchase and rental of movies, which is like a store tab icon. And then um, we get a prime, I think that would be the fourth icon and the fifth one is for the free content that you can get uh oh the the third the fourth one is live tv so you know say all the fast all the kind of pluto tv style channels and all that kind of stuff um and then the fifth and then the last one is my stuff which probably would i would assume would be all your all your rentals that you purchased and or stuff you can get with prime so that's pretty interesting in a way and um as i said apparently it's supposed to make it easy so you could find what you want to watch and apparently be less busy and overwhelming. So that's good to see. But also should clearly, it's one thing I like is it clearly will indicate, uh, you know, content, where it's parts of the a la carte subscription, you know, there's prime channels, which you can, which where you can get different other streaming services that would normally can't be its whole app, but you can pay through Amazon, you can get it through prime. And obviously uh, that's a thing of course. And then the main prime video service. So, it should easily distinguish all that other options for content and obviously the movie rentals and purchases, which is interesting. I mean, they kind of, again, long awaited and it's great in a way. Um, when is this coming out? Apparently it's going to be coming out in the next couple of months. It'll first come out on Fire TV and Android TV uh, for smart TVs and then it'll move over to iOS and the web. So that's pretty good. As I said, it's long awaited. If you use it, you're going to love this and uh, it should make life a touch bit easy if you know what I'm talking about that is so good on Amazon I mean this is one of those things we really wanted and I'm sure a lot of people who use Prime Video really wanted was a much better UI because it's it's so hard to navigate and uh, again it's quite archaic it's kind of out of touch for 2022 
So again, pretty interesting in a way. All right, if you're already into into electric, moving on to electric cars, we've kind of looked how far we've come. Um, this is something interesting. If you love Porsche, you're gonna you're gonna definitely love what you're here gonna be hearing. Uh, Porsche CEO Oliver Bloom uh, recently uh, elaborated during the sort of the recent shareholders uh, con sort of uh, they have a apparently they have a capital markets day, so that's pretty interesting. But at, at a sort of in a recent event, he announced that the a quote and I'll quote his words here: "We plan to add a new luxury all electric SUV model to our attractive portfolio, which will roll off the production line in Leipzig." This will further expand our position in the luxury automotive segment. Uh, we are targeting the higher margin segments in particular and aim to tap into new sales opportunities in this way. Now, I'm probably assuming that this, they're meaning that they're planning to create a brand new SUV that's all electric, kind of like the Taycan for electric, uh, but it's an SUV basic. So imagine the Taycan and it's literally the electric now, obviously, the Taycan is very popular. It's been a hit for Porsche, and it's brought in a lot of sales for a company that's basically all its life been known for making German sports cars, in a way. And there's going to be an all-electric Macan, so that'll that'll be coming down the road. That's a crossover. So, I think that's based on a on a Volkswagen uh, platform. I think the Macan, because the Macan is a crossover to me. So I. Th so it would be based on a Volkswagen platform, not not a dedicated powertrain that the Taycan has. The Taycan and the e-tron uh, GT share a dedicated platform that both Porsche and Audi have made. And this one probably would be a new platform, obviously something from, from the parent Volkswagen. So that's pretty interesting in a way. And apparently it will fit somewhere between the uh, somewhere between the Cayenne and the Macan, potentially, or above both above the Cayenne even. So that's that's pretty interesting in a way. Ever since Porsche made SUVs, it, obviously they've become hugely successful and hugely popular. So that's pretty interesting. Apparently, this new top tier SUV will come with technology that came from the Mission R concept that included things like oil-cooled electric motors, a natural fiber reinforced plastic potentially, a high performance battery, who knows, solid state batteries. That that could happen. I'm I'm I'm. It's obviously that's not confirmed, of course. But again, it could happen potentially, in a way. Um, and now you're probably wondering about the other Porsches. You know, they have the Taycan. We've got the Macan. We've that's going to be electric eventually because people buy electric Porsches. It's popular. I love Porsche, and if you think about it, um, they're going to have the high end SUV. And what about the other Porsches? Apparently. Um, obviously, people forget to realize Porsche uh, Volkswagen is looking to take Porsche public on the stock exchange, so that's obviously top of the mind for the German car maker. And uh, apparently, uh, we could be seeing a Cayman or a Boxster that's electric. I feel that that would come first before a fully electric 911. I think the difficulty with the fully electric 911 is probably the architecture, the placement of motors and batteries. So who knows? Who knows? They probably uh, could be waiting till the next decade for a, for, um, it, it could probably, as I said, uh, we could be waiting till the next decade for a fully electric 911, uh, because it's obviously the fastest sports car that Porsche brings to the table. But then again, I, I'd expect the bo uh, a electric Boxster, probably the 718 to be electric. Oh, um, Bloom obviously touched on this, that, quote, we want to offer our 718 mid-engine sports car exclusively on all electric form. So, as I said, but on the flip side, to be fair, Porsche apparently has been looking to get into Formula 1, because obviously that's going to be on sustainable biofuels and, so, and again, uh, on e-fuels and it's hybrid, and not all their cars are going to go electric. I mean, so from the looks, what we have seen here, the Macan and 718 will go electric potentially, and then the Taycan's there, and then the high-end SUVs there, and then the 911 is going to exist for the time being for some people, but I think, and also Porsche is pushing forward on the work for e-fuels, they're not looking at hydrogen fuels, they're looking at e-fuels, and that could be a thing. That's pretty interesting, um, in a way, that they're, they're looking to make a high-end SUV, um, and that's a pretty interesting development. I mean, uh, I think it would, it would be as I said, it would be quite 
it would, it would be popular if it has the right kind of features, if it has the performance, the comfort, and it's much better than Taycan. It could sell pretty well, and again, it could be it would make Porsche more iconic, probably on par with Tesla. Who knows? So, I might, I might be, I might be, uh, I don't want to jinx myself. I mean, uh, let's see. I mean, and but this kind of car will probably will be coming in a couple of years' time. So, it is what it is, to an extent. Alright, it's 2 in the morning, and this leads us to the end of, our, of today's episode, this week's episode, pretty much. What do you think of everything you've heard today? Everything from Netflix's attempts to crack down on password sharing, to the Renault 8 and 8 Pro, and then Samsung's upcoming foldables, and and these, and then this Porsche car that we'll probably be seeing down the road. What do you think of everything you've heard today? Let me know. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at saying underscore my uh, follow me there if you can, send me a message, well, I'll be happy to talk back, and obviously uh, hear from you uh, in a way. Subscribe wherever you're listening right now, and yeah, uh, till next week, this is Yvonne I'm signing out. Wherever you are, whatever you're up to, stay cool, stay safe, and yeah, take care, alright? Have a wonderful day, alright? Thank you for listening, ciao!